All set, Madam Chair. Right. Thank you, Emily. Following the order, the need is set for a meeting of June 27th. The first order of business is um, to say congratulations to the meeting boys volleyball team. So if you all would come up for just a second. We have some of our seniors here with us today and Coach Dave Powell. You are all on the way. So, um, there were five seniors on the team, which I understand. And we have maybe the three of you want to introduce yourself. Or you start with you, Coach, yeah. Coach Dave Powell. Uh, I'm Ethan. I'm Raymond. And I'm Alex. Welcome. And the uh, other two seniors who are not here are Henry and Jonathan uh, tonight, but you're part of a whole team. And um, you have had an amazing feat, as I understand. This was your third championship back to back. Has anybody ever done that before in volley volleyball? Oh, it's happened a couple times. We were the third team. Back to back to back. And have you all played since you were freshmen? Uh, yes. These guys lost their freshman year due to COVID, so they started as sophomores. So they've actually never lost a varsity match in three years, 73 in a row. Pretty incredible. Thank you. Congratulations. Amazing. Anybody want to say, because you probably know some of these gentlemen, yeah, well, right? Yeah, I have a senior as well, and he was thrilled to come and rush the field. The court when you guys won. So, congratulations. Very exciting for the entire community as well as the team. A big deal. You guys, congratulations. That's great. You know, it's, it's not whether you win or lose, it's whether you have fun. But I'm really happy you had more fun, more fun than any other team. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we we just want to say we're glad you could, were able to come in. I don't know if you're going to be in the Fourth of July parade. Are people going to see you again? Yeah, all uh, the program will be there. These guys have to go play at nationals in Orlando, so they won't be there. All right. I so understand you. Twenty guys are up there marching. You're here. anxious to get <laughs> to practice for nationals now, <laughs> so I don't want to be keeping you. If you have anything else you want to say to anybody. You are welcome to say it. Otherwise, we're glad. Congratulations and good luck to your teammates who are still here. Yes. Maybe there can be a back to back to back to back. Uh, I hope <laughs> we so. All hope. We can all Work hard. We're going to enjoy this one for now. Right. And good luck in Nashville. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item that we are going to do on our agenda tonight, um, if I could invite the Board of Assessors up and um, Melissa and Artie Soros, if you could all come so we can have some discussion here. Um, there is a need to have a joint meeting with the Board of Assessors to appoint a vacancy on the Board of Assessors. So I'm gonna turn this over to Kevin um, since he and John did the interview. And made the recommendation. So, All right. um, thank you, Madam Chair. All right. So, as with full confidence, Mr. Bullion and I recommend Arthur Zoros for the Board of Assessors. Um, Mr. Zoros has a past experience with this board and provides institutional memory. He has completed and passed his state certification as an assessor, which is a big plus. And previously, he was elected to the Board of Assessors and carries, although from a past election demonstrate support of the voters. So we are grateful that Mr. Soros is willing to volunteer his time, his expertise, and good sense to the betterment of this town. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Any and comments then, from the assessors? Well, only, before I make a comment, I am gonna call the Board of Assessors to order because we didn't do that pre previously, it's Michael and I, and uh, I concur with everything Kevin said. And, uh, you know, we're excited with, uh, with Artie having the most recent, three years of experience um, and being qualified, um, I think is a bit, will be a big plus for the board, so. Great, thank you. And I do note that we have um, the town clerk, Ms. Eaton here as well, so we can take care of everything at the same time. Are you? Do you both boards have to vote to appoint? I believe we'll have to roll call vote through both boards, yes. So I was gonna say that um, I would welcome a motion. Sure, I make a motion. The select board and board of assessors vote to appoint Arthur Zoros 
to the Board of Assessors until the next town election. Second. All right. And it, I think we'll roll call through everybody since we have two boards here. Kathy? Yes. Kevin? Aye. Heidi? Yes. John? Yes. Michael? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Congratulations. Congratulations. You're, you're assessing again. So thank you. Thank you again, board of assessors. And Carry on, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. The next item that we have tonight is um, I am realizing that we had public comment at the front. I was not notified that there's anybody for public comment. So just a quick look. Okay. Um, the next item tonight is a uh, recognition of. I'm sorry, Mary. It is swearing in out. They, they don't have to do okay. that here of Dave Roach. So if I could ask Mr. Roach to please come up for his service. And I know that we do have a certificate of appreciation here. What I'm gonna say, Dave, is mm -hmm. I thank you because you brought sanity, of course, to the building department. At least that's what the rest of the town thought at the time <laughs> that you came and, and throughout. And I am grateful for your many years of service and for all those years that the builders and the people in town all come and say, well, he has common sense and they appreciate that. And you uphold the building code and that's important too. Right. Very critical. So I'm grateful for all those things. Um, do we wanna start maybe a little bit with the resolution or we'll come back to the end comments? Sure. I, okay, Kevin, can you please give us our certificate so people have dimensions, <laughs> dimensions of Dave. Okay. Town of Nita, Massachusetts, Select Board, David Roach, in recognition of 26 years of public service in the profession of building inspection, 24 years as a building commissioner, and 12 years as Needham's building commissioner and leader of the building department. Your tireless effort and dedication to the trade will benefit the town and its residents for decades to come. Thank you, Dave. I'm so we're not sure that we're going to let you go actually you know that right i've been hearing that for a year yeah well it's taken us a year to get to this point we're not there yet so I, i'm just warning you in case something happens between okay. now and then um any comments from my fellow board members yes um thank you very much it's been you've been a hero to the town and you've had a hard needle to thread it's hard work and I was in a CAPC meeting several months ago. You were, the, you were with us talking and people were throwing things out about solar canopies and whatnot. And you were just able to sit there citing chapter and verse off the top of your head about what made it, what mattered and how it should work. And so thank you, you're brilliant and you've been great to the town. Thank you. So, and I've been with you on a couple of committees now, and I'm grateful always for the pragmatic common sense that you bring and just keeping us grounded in our discussion to figure out how we can go forward. Um, and I know we have a couple of folks who are also here tonight who are also grateful for that, and that's why they're here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just say, well, thank you, but also to echo what Marianne said, I, my experience with you and the building department was doing one renovation prior to your tenure and one renovation after. And I will say that um, everyone, builders, <laughs> the actual construction workers, all think that uh, you made a giant improvement. And as a resident, I can tell you that the, the, the process was significantly less painful. So let's mm -hmm. say thank you. And uh, on behalf of the town, good luck. So I wanna give you a chance to say something that I hope you have a wonderful next stage in whatever you have planned. Looks okay. like Ms. King would like to say something. I would, I would, um, because Dave, we have a party for him coming up on Thursday. Um, it's open to the public, 4 to 6 p.m. in Power Saw, but um, I think I'll be more I'm seeing at that. So I want to take this opportunity. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Dave and I was trying to think of like, what are the things I've come to appreciate the most about him? And you've named a lot of them already, but I'm going to say my top three. Um, I have yet to find somebody that has not earned, that Dave has not earned their respect, whether it's his teammates in the building department, um, homeowners, builders, contractors, um, which is a real uh, accomplishment. And the points you've made already about 
walking that tightrope between consistent enforcement and application of zoning and building code, but laying out with pragmatism is a nearly impossible job. And I think Dave's done it better than, than most and nearly anyone. Um, but I have also come to appreciate his character. Dave is a straight shooter. Um, he's honest, he's reliable, and um, he takes the job seriously, but not himself. And um, I will miss that about working with you very much. So thank you for your service. I hope you have relaxation in your retirement <laughs> and building only when you want to. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and congratulations on a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. So it's kind of funny how the journey started. <clears throat> I was uh, I was in Franklin for almost 15 years. We were doing a project one day and some homeowner come up and said, I was working with the DPW. We were, we were putting siding on one of the town buildings. And he said, why are you doing that? Blah, blah, blah. And he says, that's a waste of money. He calls my boss. My boss called me five minutes later on the cell phone. What are you guys doing? I was like, we're improving one of the buildings and we're putting siding on. It's no big deal. That's a capital improvement you guys shouldn't be doing. So needless to say, it was out of my job description. I really was kind of like helping the town out. I was a little upset, went back to the office, turned my computer on, and there was a job opening, town need them. <laughs> <laughs> so timing is everything. Bad timing for them, good timing for you. <laughs> I applied and I says, there's no better time to look for another job, especially when you don't need one. So I thought it was kind of unusual when I came over here and I interviewed once and I'm like, all right, yeah, well, we'll see you in a couple of days. I interviewed again and I said, all right, we'll see you in a couple of days. And I'm like, third interview. <laughs> so on a Friday and all right, well, okay, well, very much, you know, thank you. We'll see you later. And uh, that was it. I'm like, what is going on? Did, did I get the job? I don't get the job. So Chris Coleman called me that night at home and he said, listen, I don't want you squirming in your seat all weekend long. You got the job. We're going to get you what you want, but be prepared. You're going to walk into a hornet's nest on Monday morning. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, there was a zoning issue and, you know, that started off the, the journey, but, um, you know, honestly, taking over this department was was not an uphill battle it was just like you know as my mother said treat people like you want to be treated and, the, and it's very simple philosophy and you know and that's you know what we do and it's uh, uh trying to convince everybody else in the department the same you know the same way and eventually they left and we got new staff in and you know and i think uh we have a pretty good gang down there so it's not me it's the department. So, you know, um, I've been fortunate that the town gave me this opportunity. I've been fortunate the FinCom has supported me all these years. Dick Riley from day one walked into my office. What do you need? This is like the golden egg. You only get it once. So <laughs> you ask, ask the first year because you probably won't get it again. And I was able to get additional staff and, you know, town vehicles and we've just upgraded over the years and become more of a, I think, um, a face of the community and, uh, and we got, like I said, all good people. There's a, there's an excellent core of builders in town. There's a few we got to watch and then a few we don't really have to, but um, for the most part, there are some um, excellent builders in town and we've, you know, built, built a good relationship with them and friendships that, you know, we'll have for forever. And it's not like you're the building inspector and they're the contractor. You're in business together. Their business doesn't work without, without us and we don't work without them. So, you know, it's, it's, we, under, I understand after having my own business for 25 years before I became a building inspector, what it takes to, um, you know, feed your family on Friday nights. So, you know, that's important. And, uh, you know, that's, that's basically been it. I think, you know, we've made vast improvements to the zoning, um, you know, and across the board. And, and I, I didn't even realize how many changes we've done to the zoning until I started to explain to the new commissioner some of our zoning. 
And I was like, whoa, you know, I could pick this up in a couple months, but uh, it, uh, it's been good. It's been a quick 11 years um, at the party. We're going to have some, some numbers we throw out there, but there's some ridiculous amount of permits we've issued in, in 11 years, some more ridiculous amount of inspections we've done in 11 years. I mean, this town, even through COVID, doesn't stop. The little train just keeps going. So um, it's good because, you know, an eight-hour day seems like a four-hour day, but, you know, uh, weeks go by like days, and, you know, and and uh, and it's just, it's quick. But uh, looking forward to retirement, for sure. Um, sold our house in Norfolk. We're moving out to the western part of the state. We have a second home out there on the lake. So uh, we'll uh, enjoy that. And uh, we're only an hour away from the grandchildren, just far enough, but <laughs> 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 yes. So uh, I, I appreciate everything uh, the town has done for me. Well, we've been grateful to have you. And uh, hopefully on Thursday, we'll see a, a number of other residents from town and builders and some other people hopefully coming to say thank you mm -hmm. and uh, that was 4 to 6 p.m yes. in powers hall if people would like to join us Great. but it's been it's been a wonderful 12 years we've mm -hmm. been grateful to have you i agree so our next item also includes katie and dave on weights and measures so Katie, thank you. We're making Dave work to his last hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, this is said, we haven't let him go yet. That's yeah. right. Um, no, this is timely um, to close this out under uh, Dave's watch. So, um, by way of background, I think um, most of the board members know, uh, as a town under state law with more than twenty thousand residents, we have an obligation to have a certified sealer of weights and measures on staff. That person's job is to inspect um, gas station meters and um, scales at grocery stores and the such. So if you get a pump a gallon of gas, you actually get a gallon, um, et cetera. And to answer cons consumer complaints about pricing or if they feel like the scales are off. Um, the state had done this service um, for the town for a number of years under a contract that we had. They notified us um, that they would be ending that contract this time last year. Um, and so there was a handful of communities that um, were in a similar situation we got together with them and with Norfolk County and said, you know, could we regionalize this service? So um, what's before you today is an intergovernmental unit agreement where Norfolk County is agreeing to take this service on um, for the town of Needham. Just say the highlights are it's a three year agreement. So it's start if um, approved July 1 and it would be for fiscal year 24, 25 and 26. Um, financially, there's a one time capital contribution of $10,000 from the town to help them get um, built up on the equipment that they need, potentially a vehicle. Um, and then we'll have a $12,000 operating fee annually um, each year for the three years. That uh, amount matches what we had been paying the state and it's already built into the building department's budget for FY24. Um, the county will has already hired a sealer, so they're ready to go, and they'll be doing the inspections, keeping us informed. We have a fee schedule. We will invoice for the inspections the county does, and the town re retains any fees that are collected. Um, and I just would put a pin in um, so that you can expect it in the future. We are going to be taking a look at those fees and probably updating them and talking to the other count municipalities in this regional service um, because we're kind of all over the map right now. So um, we will be back to you um, with that. Um, so I just want to thank Dave. He literally dusted off me measures and scales that we had <laughs> in his office and oil provers that we used to test oil tankers um, and brought them to the state to get them recertified to figure out what can live, you know, another life and what we had to um, really let go of. Um, but more importantly, he's really set the town up for success for at least the next three years, but if not more than that. And I think this is an excellent example of a regional service that will serve us all well. So happy to answer any questions. I think this is a great outcome because when the service went away, we were not sure what was going to happen and certainly not how we were going to do it. So I'm glad to see it's all come together. Any questions from the board? All right. No, no questions. Need... Yeah, we do need a motion. We do need a motion on this. Okay. So I would welcome a motion. 
Madam Chair. Dave particularly would welcome a motion yeah, and vote. Yes, yes. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move uh, the, the board adopt the intergovernmental unit agreement for services for a sealer, certified sealer of weights and measures between the County of Norfolk and the Town of Needham. Second. Great. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 4 0. Okay. We're off to the races on weights and measures. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. We will see you on Thursday. All right, good. Thank you. All right, now that brings us to a general update with the Department of Public Works. So Karis Lustig is here and- Squeeze in the consent calendar. Sure, make a motion on the consent Madam calendar. Madam Chair, motion we accept the appointments and consent calendar. Uh, any discussion on that? I do note that we have um, the common visual license for the Hungry Poet King restaurant group on here. Um, this is not the alcohol license, but just for food for a second restaurant. Yes. So um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Four zero. All right. Karis, it's always a good night to have you with us. We are looking forward to this update, but I got to tell you, you have so much go work going on. I have <laughs> no clue how you're keeping track of all of it. It's got to be like the biggest master plan going on some wall or some computer somewhere. So um, she's going to tell you everything that's going on and all the various teams that are out working in town and what's happening next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I wanted to come to the board to give an update of what DPW is doing this construction season. Um, because the season was a little bit milder uh, this winter, we really didn't have any plowable events. We had events we had plows ready to plow, but the snow never materialized. Um, so we were able to start earlier. So as I'm giving you this update, we've already st started or uh, finished a few of these projects. Um, you'll also see that there's a lot of work happening in the street. And while uh, quite a bit of it is public works, a lot of that work is actually Eversource in town. Um, right now, Eversource has up to four active crews in the town at any given moment, working on a primarily gas main projects. Um, this is all part of their mandate to replace older gas main for um, safety reasons, as well as um, some other electric work that they have in town that's underground electric work. Um, we try to limit them to some extent in town because we can't tear up every road um, all the time. And we do have to provide inspectional services for the work that they do to make sure um, that they are following our rules when it comes to uh, managing our pavement. Um, we are looking and evaluating right now the town street opening permit that we have um, for updates. One of the things we've been looking at is our permit was really structured with the idea that Eversource was going to be doing small main work or that people would be doing utility cuts in um, adding in new homes. We really weren't thinking that Eversource was going to be doing wholesale replacement of mains and tearing up large stretches of road. Um, some of the things we've been working on has been negotiating with them on um, a whole host of projects that they're doing to try to either get additional pavement. So you'll see on Highland Ave, you'll see on Chestnut, they did a curb to curb um, repavement for the town, which will help restore our roadway network. And then for roads um, where they wouldn't typically, because they're not on a moratorium, have given us um, that level of service, we're actually having them write the town a check for the cost that they had to repair the roads, and we'll be doing an overlay of those roads. Um, so we're working at enhancing our own um, street opening permit to provide greater accountability and also trying to make sure that our roadway network stays at a high level and that cutting into the roadway network doesn't depreciate um, the condition of our roads. Um, we still have supply chain issues. I think I talked about this last year. Um, they're in a few different areas. One main area we have is HVAC equipment. Um, they're looking at 40 to 52 week lead times on some pieces. Um, we have a uh, curb, which has about a 12 week lead time for, um, for curb, which was a little better last year. We had a lead time and they were concerned that because of changes in the industry, we were gonna be almost a year out. Luckily, we can still get it within the season, but it requires us to be very proactive about the work that we're doing in advance to make sure that our, our orders go in. Um, and then vehicles, we still have issues getting vehicles in a timely fashion. Right now, um, because the market is still so strong with vehicles, we're sort of the last 
people that dealerships want to sell to because they're selling it to us at a pre-negotiated rate versus a market rate where they um, can potentially um, get more, more money. So we've been working on all of those items, trying to make sure that we're planning as far in advance as we can and trying to figure out how to be adaptable. We also have lots of projects that are not just funded by our capital program, but also through ARPA um, and other earmark work that we've been doing. So in addition to our normal projects that we would have had scheduled, um, we've been utilizing those resources. We're trying not to take on too much. So we're trying to re, um, readjust our capital plans to make sure that we're still taking on an appropriate workload um, so we can manage all those projects that are happening. And DPW more broadly outside of just construction is still dealing with staffing challenges. It is a industry-wide issue. It is not unique to Needham, um, but we are having uh, difficulty hiring laborers, HMEOs, crafts workers. I guess if anyone knows anybody uh, who's looking to apply for jobs, we've tried to get really creative about our postings. We're posting generic positions. So we're posting for all divisions interviewing people for multiple divisions and seeing if there's the right fit for people. Um, the labor job is an entry level position. Typically speaking, it was a high demand position. We're hiring right now without licensure and then training once you become an employee. So we're really looking for people who wanna start their careers in construction, um, but I think so is every other town. So we're trying to figure out how to make ourselves um, unique in that field. So we are continuing to hire and that's um, taken on quite a bit of our time. On the plus side, we've had a very successful succession planning program where we have had 14 promotions within the last year in DPW, which is a huge success. The downside of that is that it takes longer to hire somebody from the outside because we're sort of moving people up. So it's been successful. And now we're trying to figure out how to draw that next group in to put through our program and hopefully grow our department. Um, for project updates, I started off with our highway division. Um, they uh, are focusing on the right of ways. And um, one of the things we've been focusing on in the past couple of years is when we touch streets that have um, have you know, lines in them or crosswalks in them that we're updating them to our new standards. We're evaluating them for complete streets. We're looking at um, any improvements that we can make while we're in those neighborhoods. We use a few different surfacing treatments in town. And so I just wanted to like spend a minute just explaining the difference between the two. So um, paving is sort of your, everybody expects to have um, a full uh, asphalt course on their um, property. We do, don't do that in every single neighborhood. So the town of Needham 20 years ago really had not had a lot of road work done. And what we have done is a series of treatments to stabilize the roads roads that haven't had pavement in that 20 year period or the roads we're focusing on or main roads. Um, for roads that have had pavement in the last 20 years, we're looking at doing surface treatments to extend the life of that pavement. And we use two different um, products. We use microsurfacing, which is used on main roads. And that's just a thin course um, of pavement. And then we use um, a product that we call double rubber chip. Um, and it's a product that has a rubber component to it and two different sides, sizes of stone that after two or three years looks very similar to pavement. It is much cheaper to apply. It doesn't raise the road up and it preserves the road for 10 to 15 years. We get comments a lot like, why is this road getting pavement and this road getting um, chip? I think sometimes people think like they know somebody or there's like a certain affluence and that's not the case. We really are alternating courses. So we're doing pavement. And then the following time, 10, 15 years later, we're doing double chip. If you haven't lived in your house for a long period of time, you might not know the history of you know, when roads were paved, um, but that is our intention. And so there's no special treatment given to any special road. We are putting down the correct treatment in the correct place. Um, I have a list here of all the roads that we're gonna be addressing. The only thing I just wanted to clarify is West Street. Uh, we're only doing one section between Highland Ave and Hillside. The rest of West Street was done a few years ago and that's actually one of the areas we have added a bike lane to. And we've recently added um, a uh, pilot of adding green to the intersections there. And we'll be continuing that throughout the town where we have bike lanes. Um, for sidewalk, we have been looking in our highway division when we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion about the infrastructure that we build and how does it facilitate people who are moving through the town in all the different ways, walking, biking, um, public transit, and 
vehicles. And so we've been focusing and looking at areas where we have affordable housing to make sure that they have appropriate networks of um, sidewalks to get from where they are to public transit or to our downtowns. So one of the areas we focused on this year was um, St. Mary's and Central Ave. We've been doing a road narrowing project on Central Ave for the last two years. Um, where we've been taking away a small amount of pavement, adding in a larger berm, adding in a bike lane, and really completing, com, uh, creating a complete streets environment there. Um, we've done, we're doing a few other sidewalk improvement areas to close out our um, school routes and business areas sidewalk work. And we're hoping to work with the new mobility committee in the next year to help develop our policies for working on neighborhood streets. We um, have we are in the process of finishing the um, Mark Tree and Central Water Main project, the 16-inch Water Main project. Um, they were supposed to finish the paving last night, um, but the weather had other plans. So we'll be hopefully finishing the paving tonight, and then we'll be putting markings down in that area, and that project will be finished. Um, we have we are just finished or just finished at the end of this year, the beginning of this year, the Walker Pond phase one project. So that was dealing with um, best management practices as far as stormwater is concerned, um, trying to clean all of the inputs into Walker Pond. And we're gonna be working on phase two this year. We um, are almost done with the Rosemary Street water main replacement. Um, so if you haven't seen it, we had a water main that was actually underneath Rosemary Lake, which is a problem. If you have a leak, you won't know it because you won't see it. It's in a lake. So we've relocated the main to Rosemary Street, and that work will be primarily completed before the um, July 4th 5K race with a little bit of work done just after. Um, but the early season allowed us to get started on that project, so we're not interrupting too much the pool um, operations. We're working on this fall getting out a bid for relining a large interceptor sewer that is along 128 and Greendale Ave. And we are finishing up a replacement of a sewage pumping station on Lake Drive. We did one section of um, drainage improvements that will impact concrete at Burnside. That was the disruption that we had on Greendale Ave earlier this year um, for people who commute that way. And we will actually be doing further sections of that um, this year. Since again, we were able to start the work earlier, we're able to get more done. We have our own small diameter water main replacement program that we do in house. We do this with our water staff. It's actually a great training opportunity for our staff to be able to learn how to work on a water system in a non-emergency situation. And then we have a regular program of lead service replacements. Um, we're getting to the tail end of that, as well as um, a brook and uh, culvert cleaning contract that we'll be executing. Um, we have a renovation of a cloud field. We had the kickoff today on that project, which will be turning that into a softball field, as well as repairing a drainage um, item that we had um, underneath the field. We are almost complete with the town common. So we have a few little finishing touches to put on, a couple of lights that need to get repaired, and um, the uh, bench swings, which I think everyone's really looking forward to. Um, we're waiting for those to be delivered. We're working on a GPS upgrade for our vehicles to help um, better manage um, a whole host of operations, but most importantly, our snow operation. At the RTS, we are working on the building ventilation this summer. We'll be replacing the employee trailer that is there that I think is about 15 years old. Um, and we were, are working on a delivery service delivery study for the RTS, um, which um, had a little delay because of the prices that we received for that project. We're going to be putting that out and working on some survey work um, internally and uh, looking at the replacement eventually of DPW at 470 with some new um, opportunities we're hoping to provide modern facilities for our staff. Um, I mentioned the lead time. There was a 40 week lead time on the library chiller that we had come up and asked for ARPA funds for so we could address it uh, this for the summer. Um, so we essentially have a staff person who's sitting and watching the chiller over at the library to make sure that it continues to operate um, for the, the summer until we can receive um, the chiller and have that work done. We're doing a locker room upgrade at the Pollard, which includes installing um, some gender neutral spaces for for the bathrooms there, as well as upgrading that um, entire locker room. 
We're going to be replacing two um, boilers at the high school with condensing boilers, replacing a boiler at the Mitchell with a condensing boiler and doing several flooring replacements throughout the town. So I think, as you said, there's just a few things going on in town. Um, I also came today to get some feedback on some structural changes that we're looking at making um, in the street. So I had committed in the past that when we were going to be making some significant changes to the aesthetic or the way that the town operates to come and get some feedback. Um, the first item that I have is a new standard for guardrail in town. I think um, everyone who's driven around town has sort of seen, and you see it all through New England, this very quaint white picket fence aesthetic for guardrail, which is very aesthetically pleasing, but not particularly effective when it comes to stopping vehicles. So we are looking to upgrade these um, non-compliant guardrails in town. Um, I think one of the concerns has been that no one wants to look like a highway. So we're trying to find materials that we think are appropriate for the use, but also have um, an aesthetic advantage. So we go to the next slide. Um, I have two different options that we're looking at. So the first is for lower speed areas. Um, we currently have uh, an old style guardrail at Far Farley Pond, and we're looking at replacing that with a wooden guardrail. Um, you can just see instead of the rounded guardrail that doesn't really support anything, it's a little bit more structural than what we have. And then at Dedham Avenue and a few other locations in town, we have that white picket guardrail. And what we're proposing is this sort of burnished looking um, steel guardrail that has more of a brown rusted aesthetic as a rusty aesthetic as opposed to um, <coughs> a shiny steel look. Um, there's a few different new products that are out there. So I'm not certain it will be core 10, but it will be something that has the same look uh, and feel as what you have in the pictures here. Can I tell you that I looked at it and I thought, huh, looks rusty. Yeah. So I'm not sure how I feel about it. I, I do want something that's useful, however. So within that constraint, I, I, I get the problem. So as far as, you know, the shiny steel that you see on the highway versus this, is there an aesthetic preference? Uh, okay, I'll tell you the wood one. I'm good if that looks great, fine. Yeah. Um, I had the same reaction. It looks like um, it's just rusty and <laughs> like you need a tetanus shot if you <laughs> ran into it. It just looks old. I mean, it, I, I get your point about the shiny aluminum just I might have a um, highway feel, but this just looks like old highway. So could we, <laughs> is another option? Or? So maybe it doesn't look like that in person. That I mean, that's yes. what I don't know. I was sort of thinking, would it be useful to actually see it? Yes, and I can... Um... I was just driving by it the other day. I can give you all the location and I can send that around um, to have people go and look at it. We have uh, one in town. The only difference is that there's wood um, in the backing of the one that we have in town and the one we would have would have to have steel posts. Okay. So is functionality is certainly the most important thing, but I, I would be happy to go drive and look at but the alternatives and see if I feel the same way seeing it in person as I do seeing it in the picture. Our highway superintendent is retiring soon and he keeps on joking that his whole goal will be to create an aesthetically pleasing functional guardrail because right now there really isn't a great option. Are those the two choices though? Like silver? Right now they are. There is another product that they gave us that they said looks similar to this, but it might look less rusty and more brown. So I will um, see if I can get some photographs of that as well. That'd be great. Thank you. We appreciate your asking. <laughs> um, the Can next... they be painted? Can we paint? Yeah. I think that there's a concern with the, like the paint won't bond. Okay. Um, so there'd be a maintenance concern. Um, the next thing I'm looking at presenting is um, a recommendation we've had. I believe this went through TMAC as well, looking at narrowing the intersection of Webster and South Street. Um, this is a intersection that is very wide open. There's actually no sidewalk um, coming down Webster Street into South Street. It kind of just disappears into the street. Um, the view right now, it's, it's hard to view, it's wide open. And we know that by um, creating better channeling, um, we'll have a better result. So we had had a pilot last year for the entire summer where we had cones out in the um, area that we were planning on altering the curb. And we have cones out there right now. We've talked with all the neighbors. There was um, some resistance at one point on the section of Webster Street as it comes into Fox Hill. That's a very wide street. I think it's like 45 feet yeah. wide. Mm -hmm. um, and so we uh, spoke with the neighbors about narrowing it down to 26. 
We're doing a small bump out at the very top because there's a bus that goes there. So to make sure that there's sufficient space for the bus to go through. Um, and all the neighbors have been supportive of the project. Um, so it should have an advantage in that it's going to limit the amount of pavement. It should improve the um, pedestrian experience, and it should also improve the driver safety. We're also looking at adding a crosswalk. That's what the neighbors had asked for when they were there, um, along with an RFB to accompany it um, in crossing to connect this neighborhood um, into the rest of town. I'm curious. Um, when, well, first of all, I think that's great. I know that... South Street is heavily used by bikers and that corner that was so out of sync was very difficult for people to navigate. Um, I'm curious though, just generally, as we bring the streets in, does that mean you're making a sidewalk? Like, does that change the front line of the private property or do, are you just widening the sidewalk? How do you do that? So it depends on what was there already. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular case, the um, there we're basically adding a bigger berm in mm -hmm. between the sidewalk and the um, curb. Okay. So in other cases, you may end up having slightly larger frontage on the properties, um, or you may have a wider sidewalk if that sidewalk didn't meet ADA requirements. So it sort of depends on the circumstance. Yeah, thank you. And, and as you're doing this in this area, as you're bringing it in, are you able to create more space for bikes in just that area or how does that work? So all, as far as South Street goes, we're not taking um, a huge amount of width away from South Street. We're sort of um, channeling it. It'll make it safer for bikers and that people coming off of Webster Street will have better visibility and they won't be able to swing around the corner like they currently okay. do. Um, so there won't be any more space for them. Um, what, South Street has a really narrow layout, but it will certainly make vehicles feel tighter and maybe more likely to follow the speed limit. Yeah, I get, I like that. It's, it's a much safer approach. And South Street's coming up. When you're at Webster looking east on south, right? It's a hill. And so yes. it is blind. So this is much, much better. And will the blinking yellow stay? It will stay. Um, I believe one of the residents is going to be reaching out to TMAC to see if there's any, um, if it would be appropriate to put a traffic signal here. Um, we have other traffic signals in the queue, but we would certainly look at that in the future. Okay. Okay. And then the last one um, is a geometric change at the top of Tower Ave, Paul Revere Road, and Hoover Road. It is a very open space. We've sort of talked internally for people who've been around for a long time trying to figure out why that space is so open. I think there was a thought at some point there may have been a traffic circle in the middle of it uh, that was removed. So we have issues right now plowing it. Um, plowing the sidewalk because the sidewalk doesn't go around the entirety of that intersection. And then cars get very confused as to who has the right of way when they enter that intersection. So we tried out a few different concept plans. And what you have here is the one that we think makes sense. It's actually one we discovered by accident. Eversource has been using this area as a stockpile for their work on Webster. And they actually had utilized some of this area as part of that stockpile with cones. So we could actually see how it was impacting the traffic and found that it actually channelized the traffic much more. So this would be a proposal where we would add sidewalk, be able to plow now all of um, the sidewalk of Tower Ave, and then also bring the curb line in significantly. I'm presuming in looking at this that you looked at which proportion of the traffic goes where in that <clears throat> intersection? As you said, I, it used to have maybe a traffic circle in it. Actually, a traffic circle in that location makes a lot of sense to me. In fact, if there were ever a, a place for a traffic circle, I immediately I was like, oh, I could totally see that in that location. But I, I just think so many people come up and go across, you know, the X's in that, that, um, that I just wondered about, you know, people going here and there. Maybe this is so much narrower that it just gets everybody to slow down enough 
that that's why it's successful? Or? I think the goal is to make people to make proper right hand and left hand turns as opposed to a drift, which is what they would do right now. So if you were going from like a cross it's tower, a drift, it's just a swoosh yes. <laughs> at high speed. Yeah. So I think the goal would be to get somebody to take like a proper right and left hand turn as opposed to that, um, that drift, regardless of which direction that they're crossing. So would, where would we have stop signs? So there be some? right now there's one that is proposed. I believe the only one that is, oh, sorry. There's one proposed on um, tower turning on to tower. Yep. Uh-huh. And then there's one um, as you are going on tower, going on to Paul Revere. Right. And where are the crosswalks being? So um, I'm not aware that we would put crosswalks. We don't usually have crosswalks on neighborhood streets. We just put the ramps in, um, but I can certainly talk um, to our engineering staff about if they would be appropriate. No, I mean, why this is so great is that there's high foot traffic from Mitchell School. And um, it was always something you couldn't really figure out how to navigate. So this is, this is so much improved. I like the idea of the rotary. I was up for a rotary. Yeah. Um, but this is this is a good one too. What is strange is that it's not entirely intuitive that tower turns onto tower goes on to tower as it, it's a dog leg turn, right? Um, don't change it's it. It's just going to be weird. Yeah. But it's just it's, it's it'll be a quaint New England thing that <laughs> yeah we'll live with. So I. I don't, I'm thinking, looking at this and thinking, where would I think a crosswalk would be? I, I also think it would be tremendously valuable to have a crosswalk defined here if we could actually get kids to cross at the crosswalk, which would be the next thing. Um, but it is in that little neck where tower turns onto tower, turns onto tower. Yeah. Um, so it seems to me that it's more on the as you're walking up the hill, that it's on the far side of the turn where you're then going to cross and go straight down the far stretch of tower, more likely there. But, you know, generations of kids from the neighborhood have walked up that hill and uh, taken their lives in their hands to get across that intersection. So. For what it's worth, um, the other side of tower on, if you hang down towards Mitchell, it's on, if you walk towards Mitchell on tower, they plow the town plows on the left side. So in the winter, like you can't do the right side unless all the neighbors are really good about each other. So I will talk with Eric, uh, Ryan. I believe we do that because we don't have a sidewalk. So um, whether we would do both or if we would do the opposite side because of better connectivity, I will confirm. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. This is much needed. Thank you. Yes. I would take my kids when they're going to drive through this intersection just <laughs> to see what you're going to do. <laughs> this one, the Kobayashi Maru, um, to test drive. That was a Star Trek one. Uh, that was a good one. Thank you. Okay. And then I just wanted to make you aware of a few projects that we have upcoming that might not fully start this year or might be next year. Um, Dedham Ave. Uh, Reimagining, I guess, uh, we had an opportunity where the state was going to come in and microsurface Dedham Avenue um, as part of their own program. So they'd be doing that on behalf of the town because of some work that was happening with Eversource um, at, towards the town center. Didn't make sense to do that work this year. So we've worked with the state to grant the town the money um, they had put aside for the microsurfacing. And we will be doing that work um, next year. What we are looking at doing in the meantime is reimagining a little bit the striping on Dedham Avenue to potentially look at um, traffic calming measures, uh, lane width, uh, upgrading the ramps there, which are not, not currently meeting um, ADA accessibility, and um, potentially getting some legal sidewalk underneath the MBTA bridge and using that as a potential choke point. So this goes along with the conversation we had a few weeks ago about lowering the speed limit on Dedham Ave to 30 miles an hour. These would be some of the traffic calming measures that would complement that to get traffic to actually go the speed limit down there. Um, we're working now with a consultant. We should have some guidance. If I have enough guidance by the end of this month, I'm hoping to come back with a plan on that um, so we can start the construction of 
the ramps and the sidewalk underneath the bridge this year and then do the micro the surfacing treatment next year. Um, but right now we just didn't have a finalized plan to present. Would that include a sidewalk question? There would be a sidewalk um, underneath the bridge that would connect the two sidewalks that kind of have that little oh, okay. small sidewalk. So the sidewalk would only remain on one side of the road um, where DeFazio is, and then would um, improve the access ramps largely towards the town center, which currently are not to um, code. Kathy. So, so further to that, if somebody was in that neighborhood across Dedimab from DeFazio, would there be a sidewalk over there or a crosswalk for them to get across to DeFazio? So no, um, it would be, they would have to cross. Um, there was a conversation and we haven't engaged in it in a much more detailed way with the neighbors who are across the street in the actual street that mm -hmm. um, comes out. I've heard mixed opinions. They don't like that the people who use the park use their neighborhood as a parking lot during it. So I think there's some who would really like a crosswalk and some who really don't want a crosswalk. Um, I'd also say that one of our goals is to slow traffic down because side crosswalks give a pedestrian the impression that people will stop when they get into them. So if you don't have traffic going slow enough to begin with, that won't necessarily be helpful. So I think some of the goals were to do some traffic calming measures in advance of that to see if we can get traffic to really meet that 30 mile an hour speed limit. Um, and there is not sufficient right of way and not enough clearance under the bridge um, on Dedham Ave in order to get a sidewalk on both sides. So I'd, I'd like to just say that if if we are implementing a, a crosswalk wherever that occurs, I think it would be really prudent to have at least one of the flashing lights, if not the, the one that actually stops traffic. I mean, I guess uh, that's a self-contained unit that has its own stoplights. The only one we have right now, and I, it, the, the name of it, uh, Hawk oh, Signal, right. um, is on Greendale. Okay. Just because I think the, the traffic does move really fast there and people use it as a commuting street, but also people are like rushing because they're late to games. <laughs> and so I, I think that relying on people to use common sense around a crosswalk there would be optimistic. Yeah. Um, Similar to that, uh, Eversource I mentioned is doing Webster Street. And so we're gonna have the ability to have sort of a blackboard approach to the section of Webster Street. I think we had some recommendations from GPI, including adding a shoulder that we had not implemented yet. So we'll be looking at making sure that that gets vetted and designed so we can put in some traffic calming measures for that section. It's an excellent opportunity when you have all the markings taken away to really think about where they should go back. The, right. the yeah, plan for, would be for next year to yeah. do that work. And that will go to the um, new traffic committee for them to take a look at. Correct. Um, we have, um, which will be later tonight, the reinvigoration of the downtown streetscape um, process. We do have a, a plan to work on Highland Ave from the downtown to Webster Street as part of the state's tip process. The state has it in their queue to work on the Chestnut Street bridge that's probably three to five years out. Um, for design as a bridge replacement project. And then the town working with Dover, and Dover is taking the lead, um, has a plan to uh, either rebuild or major reconstruction on the central at Center Street Bridge. Um, that is being funded through the um, uh, earmark that we received as well as through the um, state tip. And then we have these new mobility committees that we um, are hoping to start off and get some policies and procedures in place to try to standardize some of these choices that we're making in the right of way. And I, I was just looking to see if I could find a year. All of this happens in a context of recently released data that says there's been a huge increase in the number of pedestrian deaths from traffic, which we presume is from distracted drivers. If you look at it came down over a long period of time from 1980 to 2010 or to 2015, maybe 2010. Since 2010 to 2018, it's back just as high as it was back in 1980, which is really a shame. So for everybody who's driving while they're on their phone, put your phone down, please. So important. Um, as you're looking at striping on streets that are being done edge to edge now, like Central, 
um, like even Highland Ave out here. How are you thinking about restriping that? Will it go back exactly the same as it was? Are there some tweaks that are happening now? So Highland Ave, um, our intention right now is that that will go back um, as it is currently designed, um, just because it's such a short stretch and it ties into so many different signals. Um, but for other items, we are looking at, and this is what we're hoping to create a standard. So if we have a standard that we want a 10 foot lane, that that becomes very easy to implement. Um, but we're working with consulting firms to help us make sure that the right of way that we're designing is appropriate. We have enough of a shoulder in order to narrow the lanes down. So um, where we have the opportunity to, we're looking at um, taking the lanes down. Central Ave, we did take the lanes down significantly. I think, again, it was a 40 foot right of way. And because we've added the berm, added the bike lane, those lanes, I believe, are 10 feet now. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so the corners on um, Great Plain Avenue and the latter streets um, have been being redone. They look wonderful. Um, but I'm curious if you can talk about that, because I, I think that those were I thought that they were ADA compliant before. So I'm curious what the change was that was made there. So I'll have to go back and double check. I believe they were not technically ADA compliant before. Like they didn't have the plate. They didn't have the correct warning um, detectable panels. Okay. Um, and we had issues, I think, with the construction of them where there was ponding at the bottom of them, which you don't want because obviously in the winter that becomes ice and that becomes a hazard. So um, I believe those were the two reasons why we were working on those. So if you don't have that warning, the contrasting colored warning detectable panel, they're not considered ADA compliant. And that um, panel really doesn't adhere well to asphalt. So you really have to do, that's why you'll see that concrete ramp with a mm -hmm. granite curb, and then you'll have the um, access, the warning panel on top of it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have two. Um, the RTS delivery study, where are we with that now? That came up town meeting a year ago, right? Yeah, so we went out to bid and we received two bids that were over. Okay. Um, we're looking at separating out the two components of it. So we're looking at separating out the survey, which is really trying to get a feel from the community about where it wants to invest its resources from the um, service delivery model analysis. Okay. Um, and that's where we currently are, is separ separating those two out so we can um, contract them separately. Okay, so two different studies happen? It will be one as a survey, and then one is gonna be um, analyzing different costs for different service delivery models. Okay, okay. okay. And then the uh, Mitchell boiler, <coughs> that's up, right? <coughs> I'm figuring out a lot of questions. Why are we fixing, I mean, are we have to? But how do I say to people, when we're probably gonna be knocking down Mitchell, how much is this boiler gonna cost? So, you know, it's interesting. I've been with the town for a while. I was in facilities before and I was here when the last time we looked at Pollard Hillside and Mitchell and we thought all those buildings would not be here and they're all physically still standing. So we have to continue to invest in the infrastructure that we have. The current boiler that we have at the uh, Mitchell, they don't receive parts for anymore. It's not manufactured. So what we've been doing is we replaced one of the boilers about five years ago, and we've been cannibalizing the old boiler in order to find parts for the new boiler. So the issue is you don't want one boiler running your school because if you have one boiler running your school and it dies, you have to shut down school, but worse, you can actually lose the building because if you have water pipes break or other items, it can be catastrophic. So it's really about protecting that infrastructure. And because we don't know when that new facility is gonna be built, we have to assume for at least the next two to five years that this boiler is gonna to need to carry that building. Okay. I think we're assuming it might need to carry it longer than that, frankly. Good stuff. That was great. DPW is doing an amazing amount of work. DPW is doing an amazing amount of work. And Tracy, you always give a very, very comprehensive and like easily understandable presentation. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed. We are updated. Um, that brings us to the next item, which is to set the water and sewer rates. So I'd like to invite Mr. Davis now. We heard about these at our last meeting, and uh, I do not believe we received any feedback from any citizens on this particular one. So um, tonight is the night that we would look at voting on the changed rates. 
That's correct, Madam Chair. And just to remind the committee and uh, the public is the recommendation from the Water Sewer Rate Structure Committee uh, was a plan that effectively would be increasing the uh, water step rates by 1.9%. Uh, the actual impact because of rounding purposes ranges between 1.8 and 2% and increasing the uh, sewer step rates by 3%. And based upon that plan uh, for a household that uses 12,000 cubic feet of uh, water during the year, that would result in a 2.6% increase in the annual bill. Okay. I don't know if anybody has any questions. We didn't receive any from anyone else. Otherwise, I would welcome a motion. Sure. Madam Chair, um, I move that the board approve the proposed water and sewer rates identified on the schedule below and that they be effective July 1st, 2023. And further that the board approve accepted disposal fee of $85 per thousand gallons. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have three votes. Heidi, do you want to give us a vote? We were just voting on. Yes. yes. <laughs> we have four votes in favor of, of the new water and sewer rates. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, the next item is the town manager's report. Madam Chair, the, um, the purpose of this item is to um, have a very early, what we call step zero, um, conversation about the streetscape refresh project, which we'll likely be recommending to you the creation of a committee to um, oversee the design and implementation of. We, um, the director of public works has um, an idea to create some demonstration uh, pro projects so that we would charge some of our consulting engineers with um, creating what it might look like uh, as opposed to just continuing the design that we had in place previously. And in order to give some guidance, we were hoping the board would help us do some priority setting in the areas that we hear about and that a designer would have to understand in order to um, create some demonstration projects. What, what we propose is that board members take a look at the um, kinds of um, priority items and factors that might uh, influence uh, the design. There is a section for other. I know there are some um, other ideas that people might want to add. And that once this document is complete, I would ask board members to rank them. And then in July, we could talk about sort of what's what's coming out on top. It's um, that some of these items are directly competing. So there's only, as Karis would say, there's 24 or 30 feet that we have. And so uh, there really would be a, um, a decision between the, the width of the sidewalk, the um, width of a bike lane, the amount of parking and the number of lanes, but other things are not in competition at all. I mean, there could be, you could certainly have parking and outdoor dining. I know one of the items that we were really looking at designing um, and uh, had conversations with, with board members who said, maybe we should be doing some more visioning too. So, um, you know, what do we want in the downtown? So if you have thoughts on that for your other, you know, we know we want more walk walkable traffic you know we want um we want people to be in the in downtown and be engaged and and how could how could um a designer that we engage think about that so any any feedback you have in the next week on the form itself and then we'll send it back out and have board members individually rank it and send it to me and then in july we can talk about where we go from there um the point of the demonstration projects is really to be able to show everybody who has an interest in this, what it might look like so they can say, I like this and this one and this and this one and this and that one, because it's very hard um, just in theory to see how it might look. And we're also just very mindful of the fact that, you know, for example, 10 years ago or more, the guidance to the streetscape committee that I was on was do not lose a single parking space. That was the guidance. And so that's how we designed it. And I don't think that's exactly the same anymore. Things have just changed. Um, but also we don't want to create something that will make traffic be, you know, I don't want some 
picture the worst place you have to sit in traffic, maybe, maybe the North end. Um, we don't want, we don't want to sit, uh, have people sit in traffic. So uh, that's where we bring the engineers in and say, how can we accomplish most of these things while having the traffic go through? Um, so that this is step one of many, but I'd be happy to answer any questions on the, on the concept. Comments? Yeah, no, this is great. I love, I already did it. <laughs> um, and no, it's, it's a, the tough decisions too. So it's, but that, this is really very useful. So. We will certainly be asking yeah, good the public terms. for their opinions too, but we need a place to start. So I have a, I have a question, I guess, for you. When I looked at um, some of the different street segments, once I started doing that, I rated them all the same way. Did you rate them differently by the segment or not? Um, no, I did almost, I thought the priorities were somewhat the same all the way across. Okay, so I, it wasn't clear to me that we actually need them broken into as many segments. Mm -hmm. So I'd be curious what other people find when they look at mm -hmm. that. Um, and I also found there were four characteristics there. I cared about two of them. The other two I actually didn't care about. Um, so for whatever that's worth, I, I kind of went one, two, and then it was like, whatever. 10, 10, 10, 10. Yeah. yeah. Right. So um, it, it's interesting when you actually start trying to think about how would I put a number here? Because you start to see things that are like, eh, I don't know that this is bringing more value by parsing it out this way, but right. yeah. One aspect I read was, um, on-street parking is not bad. It plays a role in um, protecting the sidewalk. It slows down traffic. And although sometimes people might, we, it's not that we can never afford to lose a space, but we don't have to lose the spaces necessarily because they do play a role too. Yeah. So it's sort of, they weren't entirely you know, right. bad. And some of the places where the parallel parking can be treacherous might be logical places to move it, right? Yes. Or where it's impeding traffic, yeah. um, being sight lines where we have a couple of those. Yeah, to that point, I guess I'd, I'd really like to see the, this downtown redesign and the park, then the results of the parking study really closely tied together. Because I think this idea of like, how many spaces do you have is not really the question we should be asking it's like how well are we using the spaces that we have and how appropriately are we using them because i think that there were a lot of improvements that that survey turned up that we could make to very easily reallocate our parking and allow for a lot more usable space rather than uh, you know giving away half of our our town common to cars so um i'd just like to be really mindful about how that plays into this great I guess also as as you guys construct the different um, possibilities, it would be helpful to understand what are the things that constitute trade offs versus what don't. Because like if people just pick and choose, they like all certain one thing from this one, one thing for another one. Those two things may not be able to coexist. So just making that clear. But I don't know that I don't know that we necessarily need to make it clear here. Because I think the way that it asks people to prioritize, they're thinking the things that are almost diametrically opposed will have different priorities because of the way that people think about it. Um, when you go through those, it's really in the first question, the options in the first question where those trade offs exist. I was thinking not so much of this, but of the actual drawings or whatever. I don't know how you guys are going to produce. Something. But that's going to take us a while still. Yeah. Yeah. But when we get to that point. Yeah. yeah. I also think there's some merit in maybe backing up a step, as we talked about earlier, and deciding, like, what do we want to bring to our town square? Are we interested in more foot traffic? Mm -hmm. Well, if so, then how do we achieve that? And these are our options. Because this, some of these seem like that second step without having maybe gone through the first. Um, you know, do we want to? increase the flow of traffic or would we prefer to slow traffic? And if so, then how do we handle our streets? You know, what does that mean for the bike lane then? Cause we only have this certain amount of pavement available to us. So I wonder if we sort of need to back up a step and decide what we want this space to look like before we design what it looks like. Well, so I think that's where Kate and Karis are looking for input from us as a start for priorities to, because I think there is, um, I think there was some feedback that happened a year ago when the plan came forward that was uh, 
fairly fairly definitive. Um, but so I think there's a desire to say, okay, where are we now? Uh, and what would we put kind of collectively at the top of our list? And then that will give some guidance for how we might go out to these um, consulting engineers just for a couple of priorities and then let them blue sky to give us some really views in what it could look like. No, I agree. I just think that we shouldn't look for the solution before we identify our objective. So, so I hope presumably they know that. Right. Yeah. yeah, out of those first set of priorities. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, increased foot traffic is a good one that should be on here. Um, so if people think of others, we can add them to that category. Okay. All right. So you want that input from us before our next right i'll send you meeting. another save your rankings if you've done them already okay. but there may be a slightly updated document that we'll send out right. yeah okay Vi you know vibrant storefronts is another example so um we can put together what we think we know what people want but if you have ideas put them in there yeah, that someone that was a village do you want a village or do you want the Eden street in new York? Well, and of course, the thing we recognize <laughs> is that Needham Street. So Needham. Do you want, if someone phrase it as like, do you want a village or do you want Needham Street in New, you know, Needham Street in New, right? We do not want that, no. or I don't want that. I don't want that. No, I don't want that. And, and I'm also going to recognize, you know, when I hear vibrant storefronts, the other thing that I carry is that we are, uh, so we will be hoping to convey some wishes, hopes, and dreams that hopefully our landlords might be receptive to as they're looking at who comes before them for possible tenants. But yes, we don't have control over that. I, I would imagine that the wishes, hopes, and dreams section, which I think is a great name, we're not going to prioritize that because you know, we want we want most of those things. <laughs> we want right. full storefronts, people to feel safe, people to want to come downtown, people to feel a sense of community. I mean that those are the. Um, I don't Maybe think we, we call them the givens or something. That 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 is where we want to end up. Just but, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Another item uh, that I'd ask the board to. Um, consider and vote on is uh, some changes to our ARPA budget. So um, mostly um, these are modest changes within the broad framework that we've been talking about for a year. So under the category of technology improvements, um, we needed to reallocate support for hybrid meetings. Um, it became more expensive than um, we had originally thought. So we're just reallocating from the uh, not assigned yet to the um, to that category. So it, you can see that the total allocation for technology remained at 275, but we're just reallocating within lines. The um, town reservoir cleanup construction we had been holding. 2,070,000 and the number that we actually had filed with the county was 2.1425, uh, must, must have been a refined number that I hadn't, hadn't caught up uh, to this chart so that um, we are working very closely with the county. We have a call with them again tomorrow so that um, we can get final approval on that. We do have final approval on the, um, the original uh, Walker uh, project, the 356,000 and we're waiting on final approval for the reservoir which um, they're only waiting for our schedule. So we know it, it's it's fine. And then uh, Karis did mention the 128 sewer interceptor project running along Greendale Avenue. And we have filed, uh, we had been holding 3.4 million um, where uh, we had reallocated 400,000 previously for the um, Walker category three, which is the outfall. And so we have filed with the county a $3 million number. So that would leave us 15,000 uh, in the county that we could apply with the project that we're doing, proposing to do on the interceptor, every dollar can be used to just go keep going another foot and another foot, because this project will be pairing with state with town money that we have in the capital plan. So all of these funds have to be committed by 2024. And if they're water and sewer infrastructure, they have to be spent by 2026. So we need to get them all um, out so that we would ask the board to um, amend the budget for those projects. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I kind of wish I asked this. I'm curious is here, but what's a sewer interceptor? I don't suppose you know. 
it, it is a very, there's a very long sewer main that runs um, along Greendale Avenue from Cheney Street all the way to Great Plain Avenue. Okay. And there are portions of it that need to be replaced and the portions of it that need to be relined. Okay. That, Dave says I've got it right. Okay. <laughs> it's big is the other thing that I'm thinking about it. I thought it's, I'm sorry. I, I think it's sizable yes. in dimension. So okay. it plays a very important role in our uh, sewer uh, treatment sending to um, Deer Island. Okay. Thank you. It would be better to Karis had answered. Right. Thank you. <laughs> She's taught me that much. <laughs> do you need a motion? I do need a motion. Okay. Now, Chair, I make a motion. This is a long one. That the board approve the updated ARPA proposed budget dated June 21st, 2023, to include reallocation of the technology improvement lines and update the town reservoir sediment removal project. The town has four projects pending with the Norfolk, with Norfolk County, Walker Category 2, ARPA-1032, or 356,000, Walker Category 3, ARPA-1166, for 400,000, town reservoir sediment removal, ARPA-1033, 2,142,000, thousand five hundred dollars and 128 sewer interceptor ARPA 1178 for three million dollars. Second. Any further discussion? I would just add Madam Chair the specificity is that it's helpful we have to send the minutes to the county and it's helpful to have it exactly spelled out. Kate and I was trying to figure out after we do all of these, does that mean that all of the funds will be encumbered at that point or what is left? I was trying to decipher that from here and it wasn't clear to me. Um, we have $2,263 on assigned in technology. Um, our temporary project manager, that line um, is we may not need to spend all of that. And the Rosemary Sluice Gate may come in under that 600,000. So more to follow on that, that they can be. And those, everything above the yellow line there is um, from, it's our allocation from the state. So it is a, it's money that we've already received and can be spent, um, can be reallocated more easily than the county numbers. And so in the county, it would be about 15,348, which we would allocate to, unless, the, any of these projects that have not yet been bid come in lower. I, I expect the 3 million to be 3 million for the 120 interceptor. We'll just keep going until we finish using that the 3 million. Money. Yeah. But the reservoir may come in lower than that. Okay. And the other, the reservoir, oh, now, now I'm really getting out of limb without Karis here, but the reservoir project includes best management practices that affect our NIPDES permit. And so there are several, there's one of them that's actually going to start this summer that um, is on the edge of the McLeod field renovation that will actually help the, the reservoir. So that is not just the dredging, but it's best management practice, BMPs that they call it for, for NIPDES that are in that number. So some time ago, there was some discussion of a sustainability project that might come from ARPA funds, do those funds still exist? I would say yes. And unused funds, they don't, do they stay in this bucket with ARPA or do they go to free cash? Um, the Anything unused by, in the, the state funds by 2024, um, goes back to the federal government okay. through the state, um, the county, we won't let that. We won't let that happen in either. In either. Right. Okay. So. <laughs> so it may, it might be helpful at some point if there is a need for a column that says, you know, like the, a netting out kind of of, of what's left um, may be useful just to keep an yes, eye on Yes, I actually that. have that column. Okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'll add it back. Okay. This is the order that our town accountant likes to see it in. So Okay, a little less intuitive to me also with the income. But it, it's definitely, yes. we'll, we'll add. I, I was going back and forth adding going, well. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, That's so great. I'll do that for sure. But then to tell you also that there's some of these that are, um, we're holding amounts that we may not need to. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, did we vote all no. in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Four zero, thank you. The next item is a board discussion. 
and um, I need to report on an open meeting law complaint um, that the board received. So if you could give me a moment here. Um, on June 8th, 2023, Margaret Abruzzi filed an open meeting law complaint against the select board. This complaint concerns the executive session that the select board held on May 9th. This executive session was held pursuant to purpose six, which allows the board to meet an executive session to consider the purchase exchange lease or value of real property if the chair declares that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the public body. This particular executive session was held to discuss the acquisition of the foster property on Charles River Street, and the board's posted agenda identified this as the property that was to be discussed. Ms. Abruzzi alleges in her complaint that the select board did not have a negotiating position to protect relative to the foster property because it had previously voted to approve a purchase and sale and development agreement. This is the Abruzzi's second open meeting law complaint concerning the foster property. Joseph Abruzzi filed the first complaint against the select board on April 3rd, 2023. The select board provided a written response to that complaint on April 24th, 2023, and the matter was closed on June 4th, 2023, without further review from the attorney general. Anytime the local board is the subject of an open meeting law complaint, it must meet to discuss the complaint, provide a written response within 14 days. As a result, we schedule this discussion on the select board's agenda tonight. As many of you are aware, the select board has been working since the fall of 2021 to purchase a portion of the 62-acre foster property on Charles River Street. On March 6, 2023, the select board voted in an open meeting to approve a development agreement and purchase and sale agreement with Northland Residential Corporation. These documents collectively outline the terms under which the town would acquire approximately 33 acres of the foster property from Northland for a purchase price of $2.5 million after Northland acquired the entire foster property from the foster trust pursuant to a separate set of agreements between those private parties. It appeared as of March 6th that the terms of this property acquisition had been agreed to by the town, Northland, and the Foster Trust. However, notwithstanding the select board's March 6, 2023 vote, Northland has not executed the development agreement or purchase and sale agreement. And since that time, several issues relative to the joint town Northland purchase of the foster property have manifested. Reaching a final agreement to purchase the property now requires additional negotiation of terms, financial and otherwise, between the town, Northland, and the Foster Trust, and the parties will need to prepare and sign new or revised agreements if and when the open issues are resolved. The important Important point is, as of May 9, 2023, when the select board met in executive session, there was no bind binding or final agreement among the parties, and all sides are presently still engaged in negotiation with the goal of reaching a final agreement. Purpose 6 permits a public body to meet in executive session to protect its negotiating position. It is intended to preserve confidentiality and to avoid putting the public body at a disadvantage in negotiations for the property. An executive session under Purpose 6 as appropriate is appropriate where the purchase price or other material terms of the deal remain the subject of negotiation. Once a deal has been struck and all material terms have been agreed to, an executive session can no longer be held under purchase Purpose 6. But we were not there on May 9, 2023, and we are still not there yet. And I would also add, I guess, that we had reported earlier that we were not there and that there had been no signatures to those agreements. There is no final agreement between the select board in Northland or between the select board and the foster trust to purchase the foster property and material terms remain subject to negotiation at that time and at this time. Accordingly, the May 9, 2023 executive session under purpose six was appropriate. Unless there are any comments or questions from board members, I will entertain a motion to authorize town council to respond to Ms. Abruzzi on the select board's behalf in a manner that reflects this discussion tonight. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Four zero. Okay. Committee reports. Well, 
I don't have a committee report, but I would like to note that um, I attended along with Kathy and Kevin, the um, Pride, Needham has Pride Parade, Rally and Parade. And it was a lovely event as it was last year. This is the second year they've held the event. Um, and it was lovely and joyful and um, just a pleasure to attend. And, and um, just wanted to make note of that. Okay. I don't know if we've had any committees that have met. The subcommittee met today on the... Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier today. <laughs> who, who would, who would <laughs> like to talk about that one? Let's call on the senior member. <laughs> the senior member to discuss the Code of Conduct. Right? The Code of Conduct subcommittee met and we discussed the um, basically a, a Code of Conduct for employees and visitors in town buildings events. And um, it was extremely productive. I think we got some... Um, We'll be finalizing a um, something for you guys to look at the next meeting. So this is um, for uh, citizens and other visitors who come to town hall or to other town facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, really just noting that civility is a value of the town and that we would anticipate that when people come into town uh, buildings that we treat our employees and others who we encounter in those buildings uh, respectfully, right? Is, do I understand correctly? Yeah, Reminder that we're all part of this community, including our staff, but residents, patrons, visitors, everyone, and that we need to maintain appropriate behavior to our communities. Okay, great. I look forward to that. Um, I think we have done appointments and consent and we have gone through our agenda. So I believe we are ready to welcome a motion to adjourn. Uh, or Suresh. Okay. I have a note that your July meeting will not be this <laughs> I, I was gonna note that it's only 7.30 once again. So there you go, two in a row. You're gonna be chair forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> let, me, let me assure you. <laughs> All right, but I would welcome a motion while you're delaying. So so, and a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.